Hi again. Today's book in the thriller series is Front Sight by Stephen Hunter, who is the chronicler of the great American gunfight. And like many of his previous books, it is, is centrally dominated by members of the Swagger family. And in this case, um, three generations of the Swaggers. This book is three novellas, three smaller books within it. But each one is a fairly decent chunk of a story. It's not short stories. It's something you really get your teeth into. And each features a different generation of the Swaggers. We were first introduced to Charles Swagger in the book Hot Springs, where his son Earl, who is on leave from the US Marines before deploying overseas, um, tries to find out the circumstances of, of his father's death. And uh, in that book, Charles is uh, a very taciturn, uh, a haunted, complex character, a uh, very stern, um, uh, uh, many would say typically um, strict southern sheriff. In a subsequent book, G-Men, which uh, takes an earlier period, uh, in the 20s, starting in the 20s, where Charles has returned from the Great War, where he fought with distinction in the infantry. And he has been loaned to a task force to hunt down Bonnie and Clyde, and he takes part in the shooting of that murderous couple. But uh, he declines any publicity. And then um, some years later, as a result of that, um, there is a terrible outbreak of armed robberies throughout the Midwest several local state and federal law enforcement officers have been killed and the fledgling uh, Bureau of Investigation from the Department of Justice which later became the FBI uh, is recruiting gunfighters and um, so Charles gets recruited to go to the Chicago office and he's involved uh, he's actually the guy who shoots Dillinger. So uh, that was a, an interesting um, look at the character. And in the current book, he is still in Chicago, still working for the Bureau of Investigation. He always seems to wear the same dark clothes, uh, fedora hat, and he's quoted as look at, he looked like a funeral director, which was close. He was really a funeral provider. Uh, a man who is totally comfortable with violence, meeting it out to the people who deserve it. So the um, supervisors at the Chicago office have had a tip that Babyface Nelson is uh, in hiding amongst the vast population working in the Chicago's stockyards, which at that time were famous, Chicago being a railhead for the Midwest and... Uh, there was a whole area of the city which was just stockyards uh, where, the, where the cattle were collected and um, usually uh, slaughtered. And um, Stephen Hunter describes the process of 
the cattle and the behaviour of the cattle. He says, Dick, is it the molecules of blood in the air that they sense that gives them this unease? They know something's wrong. But they're herded down a, a system of channels and gates and chutes till they finally reach the killing floor where they are restrained by a yoke and then a large polax is used to stun them into insensibility which then allows uh, another worker to slit their throat and um, kill them completely. This obviously is before the days of the cash captive, the captive bolt weapon which is the more modern way of slaughtering animals. And um, a very fine piece of writing. Anyway, um, Charles goes into the stockyards and um, uncovers corruption, he uncovers fraud, he uncovers drug dealing on a massive scale and he uncovers arson. Um, as it happens, Babyface Nelson isn't there but there's enough to keep him occupied and he teams up with uh, a black police officer, Officer Washington, who is very streetwise and has his ear to the ground in, in the large black community. Chicago was a magnet for a lot of uh, the people from the South who wanted a better life, a lot of factories and so on in, in Chicago. And um, that they, they were drawn there. And um, by having Officer Washington um, working with him, he, he was able to gain access to a tremendous uh, information resource. One of the things about Stephen Hunter's books is the detail about firearms and gunfighting. He he really is very, very uh, good at it. He, he, he writes from knowledge. He, he actually knows the subject, but he also, his descriptive work is, is tremendous. And he, he always equips his main characters with very, very appropriate weapons. For example, Charles prefers his old wartime issue Colt 45, which he carries in an S.D. Myers shoulder holster. And he's very fast with it. Uh, in a previous book, he actually devotes a couple of pages to talking about the Colt 45 and why it's such a brilliant, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, such a brilliant weapon, which is, is still in use today and it, it's still every bit as good at its intended job as anything produced uh, since. Um, true, we tended to modify the pistol somewhat, but the basic design and, and the, um, the uh, reliability factor and the calibre and so on were, were all um, very, very suitable for the task. So there's a villain decides to arm himself and he, he, he goes along to a, a shady uh, gun dealer and he's looking at various weapons and this is what Stephen Hunter writes about the Colt Python. <clears throat> the revolver gleamed highlighting its extra touches such as a ventilated rib that ran along the four inch barrel and the figure eight of the cylinder release. But it was more than those details. The goddamn thing was just a masterpiece of harmonies and balances, slopes, planes and flats. And when he put it in his hand, it seemed to live of its own volition and point ahead. Try the hammer, said Ben, gently now. Badger put his thumb on it and drew it back finding smoothness, ease, but also sound effects. Click, 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 click. It said old Sam Colt designed it, so when you cocked it, those four clicks spelt C-O-L-T. Not only this gun, but all Colt wheel guns, going 
on back to 1836 of that characteristic, like a theme song, you might say. He was a genius, which you surely ain't, boy. Badger loved it, the feel, the look, the way it fit his big hand, the checkering on the grip, locking it tight into the flesh, the way it pointed, the way it wanted to shoot. Now, those of you who are conversant with revolvers will appreciate that. And I can remember sitting in a gun shop with a Colt Python, checking it was unloaded and just cocking it, gently releasing the hammer, cocking it over and over and over again. I was carrying on a conversation, but I was doing it because the tactile and auditory components of it work together so well. You have to experience it to understand what Stephen Hunter was talking about there. It really was. And I, I never owned a, a Python. I wasn't a particular fan of it. Um, apart from that, it really was a delight to sit uh, and cock it. <clears throat> so let's go on to the second part of the book which is called Johnny Tuesday this concerns Charles's son Earl who had an illustrious career in the United States Marines fighting in the Pacific where he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. <clears throat> Subsequent books, or previous books rather, have featured Earl. Uh, Hot Springs, for example, where he formed part of a task force to investigate vice and corruption in Hot Springs, a real place, by the way. And that's the thing about these books. The... There's a, lo a lot of truth in them. There's a lot of real characters. Babyface Nelson was a real character. It's got his real name in the story. Um, uh, lawmen like uh, Frank Harmer, uh, Texas Rangers, who was the guy who tracked down Bonnie and Clyde. And the idea of the fledgling FBI bringing in these... Um, experienced gunfighters was spot on um, the probably most famous was uh, Delph Jelly Bryce who came from Oklahoma and he became not only um, an instructor taught people how to shoot but <clears throat> was a formidable agent <clears throat> excuse me he already had um, several gunfights under his belt in Oklahoma City before he he, he uh, went to the feds um, some in the future I'll review um, a series of books about his life which is an eye opener so as I say there are real people in the books and um, anyway so there is a, in a small town in Maryland there is a bank robbery a very violent and bloody bank robbery and um, Earl, who is um, really in between things, is persuaded to uh, investigate it. And um, he finds that there's more to it than meets the eye. And he, he finds mob connections and uh, feuds and all sorts of things and shady financial deals. And um, he obviously solves the problem and um, there's a lot of uh, gunfighting and a lot of fist fighting along the way. Then we come to the final part, Five Dolls for the Gut Hook. And this is Ailes' son, Bob Lee, Bob Lee Swagger, Bob the Nailer, who also a US Marine, this time his war service was Vietnam where he was an outstanding sniper. 
Uh, he did other things, did reconnaissance work, and he, he was also um, seconded to the uh, intelligence agencies, but uh, he was primarily known as a sniper. And um, <clears throat> this is straight after the war, and he is basically um, struggling with the bottle. He, he is on, fast on the way to becoming an alcoholic. And um, there is a, a psychotic serial killer killing young women in Hot Springs. Now, <clears throat> this obviously ties up with uh, his father's work in, in that town, which, <clears throat> as I say, is a real town. And it did have this vice problem. It, it, um, famous gangsters, uh, uh, Oni Madden, people like that. Um, uh, Bugsy Siegel uh, was prominent there and um, before Vegas it was the place that the mob seemed to um, have as their um, basic headquarters so uh, all these different factions tried to stymie Bob's efforts he, he says himself, he said, look, I'm, I'm a sniper, not an investigator. But um, the powers that be say, look, it's your attention to detail and, and your, your um, uh, ability to read uh, people and terrain that we, we, we prize. And uh, these various factions tried to stymie his efforts, but obviously Bob wins through. So although the three generations of Swagger are all different characters, uh, Charles has flaws which were revealed in Hot Springs but haven't yet emerged in, in this book and in uh, G-Men, the previous book. But the three of them have a genetic ability to d dispense justice, to protect the weak while having no problem killing the evil. Stephen Hunter always delights with his tales of hard men who carry steel, lead and the badge. Long may he continue.